tonight, our speaker is actually a graphic designer uh, from the Orlando area. He grew up in Gainesville. Uh, some of you uh, are wearing shirts from the museum here. Our, uh, our, our dark blue shirt on the back that has a graphic from the Chamber of Commerce from the 1930s and the 1920s parasol lady that appears on our tea towels and our swim and suit cover up. Uh, all the graphic design work on those was done by Rick. Uh, he came up and uh, we went through the, the archive together. We've got other stuff we're working on. There's some really exciting things we'll be able to do as far as merchandising with some old graphic images in, in years to come. Uh, but he does uh, graphic design work. Uh, his, uh, his first book, Finding the Fountain of Youth, actually won the bronze medal from uh, Florida Book Awards. Uh, his latest book, uh, the one he's going to talk to us about tonight, uh, Florida's Healing Waters, won the Silver Award in Florida history and the Stetson Kennedy Award from the Florida Historical Society. Please help me in welcoming Rick Kilby. Had, had you warned me, I would have brought booze samples. <laughs> <laughs> but I had no idea. Actually, the deep dark family secret, uh, my family, my dad's side of the family is up from the Appalachians. And my, my grandfather actually ran moonshine and got caught by the revenueers and ended up going to the pokey. So I, I couldn't bring it or I would have. Oh, wow. One quick uh, housekeeping point too, please, and I haven't done this in a while, please turn your cell phones down and turn them off. We've got some kids locked up in the back that will help you turn them back up. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, if you would please uh, put those on silent for us. Thanks so much. Oh, I just realized I'm being videotaped to the deep, dark family secret about my moonshining past. It is now all over YouTube. So I spoke about my first book. There was a banquet held at the golf course several years ago. Were any of you all here for that? Good, it's a fresh crowd. <laughs> This book kind of grew out of that because when I was going around the state speaking about that book, I was doing research everywhere I went because I got obsessed with the idea of these, the idea of taking the waters at, at mineral springs all across the state and wondering why nobody had written about them before. So it's really a story of tourism. This is a bad year for Florida tourism, 122 million visitors. I imagine sometimes in Volusia County, it feels like they're all here at once yeah. during the busy times. Usually it's more like 130, over 130 million if it weren't for COVID. But that, the fact that we depend on our economy, tourism for our economy, goes way back till after the Civil War. And what really got me started in my obsession for that is this postcard from my first book showing the entire inside of the spring house at White Sulphur Springs. Look at all those people. And there are, you know, some of them are in bathing apparel, some of them are not. I wanted to know who these people were, where did they come from, why did they come here, and if they're invalids, how come they're not social distancing and wearing masks? <laughs> but Florida has a long history of attracting uh, invalids to the state. One of the best known perhaps was Ralph Waldo Emerson, the poet and transcendentalist, who came here in the winter of 1827. He originally was just going to go as far as Savannah, but he ended up taking a sailing vessel and spent many months here trying to get over consumption and cons I'm going to talk a little bit about consumption he met um, Napoleon Marat who was a, a well-known person well he was here and one of the most interesting thing he writes about was he was attending a prayer meeting while there was a slave auction right next door and you could hear the slave auction going on while he was in the prayer meeting and he wrote poems he wrote sermons and when he left he his health was much improved so we know that, that invalids were coming as far as 1827, which was actually just years after Florida had become a territory in the United States. Many of the people who came here were consumptives, and consumptives meant you had tuberculosis, it was a consuming disease, and that's hence the name, it was nicknamed the White Death. Some s crazy stats, at the, at the beginning of the 19th century, around the year 1800, one out of every seven people who had lived up until that time had died from tuberculosis. Fifty years later, in around 1850, one out of every four deaths in the United States and Europe was due to tuberculosis. So later that century they would discover the cause, but there wasn't a widespread treatment for that until the 20th century. So people thought being outside and taking the waters and other physical activities might help with the disease. The other thing I found really interesting is, oops, what did I do? Uh, I hit the top button. Oh, I'll do that. 
Okay, I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> is that it became fat? You know, when you when you had tuberculosis, you became pale and emaciated, and you'd have these fainting attacks. That became popular in Victorian culture. So people wore pancake makeup and tried to be thin and and had fainting spells and these special couches for people with fainting spells because that became so in vogue, which is crazy. <laughs> So you start to see books written towards invalids promoting Florida, and this was the age of a lot of popular media. There was a, a tons of guidebooks. This is one that I, I like because of this illustration. I did it again. Right there at the, at the bottom, showing this poor lady who had a fainting spell on the deck of a ship. It looks like a sailing vessel on her way to down south in order to um, try and resuscitate her health. This is just in my, my library downtown in Orlando. These are first edition guidebooks to Florida, and there was a, a wide proliferation. So it wasn't just guidebooks. You know, there was newspaper articles, there were you know, penny postcards, and there were a lot of stereographs, all trying to promote coming to Florida. And it was just this full-on media blitz. And a lot of people who were doing the development were wealthy northerners who would buy property and develop spas around the springs. But I love this quote because it seems like everybody in Florida was in on it. This guy, William Dara Ke Kelly, who wrote this book, Old South and the New, he came across this old cracker plowing a field that he thought looked really meager. And he said, how do you survive off these meager crops? And he says, on sweet potatoes and get some of Yankees. And it's like, well, what do you sell? And they, he said, we sell our atmosphere. And so that really was the mindset in the 19th century in Florida. So when I say taking the waters, I mean, Mostly balneotherapy, which is taking the waters in uh, mineral springs, which is bathing in and drinking the mineral water. But there's other ways I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about uh, bathing in seawater, which is sea bathing or surf bathing, and I'm going to talk about hydrotherapy. But I want to start with taking the waters in our mineral springs. Florida has over a thousand springs, but the ones that seem to attract development into spas were small, stinky springs that tended to have murky looking water that indicated the presence of minerals. And I found 22 that I used in my book. Of course, there's more. Some of them may originally have been a well because the differentiation between a spring and a well is really can get blurry, especially if you tap into the same aquifer, it's really the same water. So I had to differentiate. I did it again. Somehow, <laughs> the, uh, differentiate the, the springs. And I did it by ge geographical region. The ones in orange were really connected to the St. John's River, and they developed first, and I'll tell you why in a minute. The ones in blue were the ones in North Florida, mostly connected with the Suwannee River. And they developed when railroads became more popular in the state, and it became easier to reach the, the state's interior. The ones in green are, are connected to the Gulf, and it's almost like development from the state started over here and slowly worked its way over here, because they developed later. But they had the benefit of being on the water, so you could get there from ships or by railroad, but they really took off in railroads. And I'm going to talk about three or four examples. But first, I want to talk about the origins of taking the waters. There's a great quote in this book that I actually I want to read. We have um, one of the descendants of the author of this book in attendance tonight. And the, the book says, The rise and fall of the bath. The bath is as old as the oldest civilization. In the very earliest historical records, it benefits were extolled. Bathing was a de definite medical prescription among some of the ancients. Hippocrates, the pioneer of the natural method of healing, praises the great value of the bath for all acute and chronic diseases. The Hindus, Egyptians, and Persians seemed at sacred duty to bathe themselves every day. This goes way, 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 way back. The ancient Greeks thought there were gods and goddesses in springs, so they would build their temples around there, and they thought that bathing in the water where these gods and goddesses were would make you better. The Romans took it to a whole new level. I had to do a little research myself, so I drove my wife over to Bath, England in order to see the Roman baths. It's an amazing place if you haven't been there, but it's incredible because the lead pipes the Romans made are still being used today, and that's still the same spring that was used by the Celts way before the Romans even got there. So going, the, the Romans really took bathing to a whole new level. They, wherever their empire extended, they built these immaculate bathing facilities. But as Christianity rose and the Roman Empire declined, in the Dark Ages, the bathing tradition almost died out. 
but in the 16 and 1700s, a whole new bathing tradition emerged. And it was not just for invalids, it became the thing to do if you had enough income to go to the continent and go to some of these other bathing places. So you can see in this illustration, you know, the ladies are sitting in the water, they're playing some kind of board game here, she has her book, she has a, a beverage it looks like, and flowers and all this kind of stuff. It's what cultured people did. They went to watering places all across the continent. And, you can, and it, it's still that way today, you know, Perrier and all these places we associate with drinking water, Evian, started out as spa towns, and they're still known that, 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 for that today. Eventually, that came across the pond to the United States. So this is another place I drug my wife to in West Virginia. And Thomas Jefferson spent nine days taking the waters in this same bathhouse, which is remarkable. The entire time I, I was there, my wife was worried the place was going to fall on her head. <laughs> she looks like she's having a great time, but she was miserable. <laughs> After, yeah, I drug her all around the, the world, actually. Uh, unfortunately, they closed this right after we were there, but they are restoring it, so it will be reopened. It's actually owned by, the, I think, the Omni Homestead or one of the big hotels there. And it's going to be restored and reopened. And it's very interesting because the water there looks like any spring you'd see in Florida. And so there's kind of a universality. But the difference was the bottom was a little bit, the, the kind of type of rock that was on the bottom was different. We know that the indigenous people who lived here before the Europeans had, felt that water was sacred. There's a Tamukan word, it's I-B-I, I always pronounce it as E-B, I don't know if that's correct. But that's the word they use for all types of water. And they, they believe in the sacredness of nature, and that belief came forward in time when the Seminoles came here. There are stories that if they were warring tribes and they came in the presence of a spring, they would put all the hostilities aside because springs were oases of peace. And I've tried to get people from the Seminole tribe to verify that, but they just don't want to talk about it. It's very interesting. But we, we do know from archaeology that there are large shell mounds that were ceremonial, especially in Silver Glen Springs in the Cala National Forest, that indicate that, that people came from all over just to be in the, in the uh, vicinity of springs. So we know it was more than just hunting and fishing, that they believed these were sacred places. When people of European descent came, we, they saw uh, springs as resources for healing and um, turning mill wheels and drinking water. And these are some of the earliest facilities you see. This is Green Cove Springs, which I'm about to talk about more. But these are very early facilities. You can see they're very crude, just kind of shanties around probably what's the spring run. And the people who are coming here, this is mostly after the Civil War. They're, you know, a bathing tradition started, but you have to, if you look at the displays around the corner, the Seminole War really kept Florida from booming in the early part of the 19th century. And it was just starting to take off in the 1840s and 1850s, and the Civil War had kind of suspended the, the development of, of tourism, but it really took off after the Civil War. And But people who came here were affluent. And you can tell from this picture of all these people on the steamboat, they're wearing fancy clothes. And they came here in winter. There was no, no air conditioning. Nobody wanted to be here in summer. There was you know, no electricity. In, in the end of the 19th century, 19th century, so there couldn't be electric fans. Um, eventually, there was electricity. I should that should correct myself. But no, the point is this tourist season lasted from the end of December through April at the latest, and that's when these people came down here. Originally, they came on steamers that would start in New York, would go to Charleston, Savannah, and then to Jacksonville, or, or sailing vessels, and kind of come in that way as well. But then when train Travel really picked up in the 1880s to the turn of the century into the 20th century. You know, a whole new level of affluence was available and luxury, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And you can see just how beautiful these train cars are. And it, it also made it easier for people to get here. So it wasn't just the super rich. It was people who could afford a train trip. And it took, it took a very long time to get here. The travel started from Jacksonville, and I think Jacksonville played an important role in 19th century tourism that's kind of lost today, that we don't realize that. It was originally called the town of Cowford, because that's where you could take your cows across the St. John's River, 
and it was 350 residents in 1840. But by the end of that century, 70,000 people, they called themselves the Italy of America. And I love this just because of all the transportation you can see, all the, steam, the uh, sailing vessels, the steamboats coming in, and then the railroad right across the St. John's River. And during most of the Civil War, the Union Army controlled Jacksonville. Those soldiers went back up north, talked about how great it was in winter, and helped spread the word. So the rush was on. And there was also political motivations. They saw an opportunity to come here and um, try and get people from up north to immigrate here and have political control. And if you study Florida during Reconstruction, for a brief period, the Republicans actually do control the, um, the state legislature. And um, that was part of the reason why all you saw all those tour, tour books trying to get people to come here and then move here for political reasons. This is Green Cove Springs. This is Green Cove Springs and White Sulphur Springs were probably the two premier spa towns in the state of Florida. And I love this photograph. I got this from Clay County Archives. I'm not sure who took it, but the St. John's River is there, just beyond the trees. This is the spring itself. The white picket fence was probably a private bathing area because this is the Victorian era. People are very modest and they want privacy. Generally, the women and the men did not bathe at the same time. There were exceptions to that. Uh, but they also had separate bathing areas. What I love is, too, this guy right here with this big, huge camera, this probably 8 by 10 glass plate negatives, taking photographs with incredible detail like this. So from the 1870s, this is probably the heyday of uh, bathing at Green Coast Springs. And here's another uh, kind of aerial map, I should say, or rendering that I really love, again, look at all the sailing vessels. The thing you did when you went to Jacksonville is you would take a trip up a river and you would go to Palaka, get to a, on a smaller vessel and take it up the Ocawa River to Silver Springs. But when you did, you always stopped at Green Cove Springs. And the spring itself is right here. It's a small third magnitude sulfur spring, real stinky still today. And they just love the stinky water because they believed it was good for you. And one of the things you would do would be to promenade up and down this path right here along the river. It was called St. David's um, Path. And one of the, you would go to down to here, which was another mineral spa called Magnolia Spring. And I'm not sure how big the spring was there initially because they kept supplementing the water by drilling wells. They call this the spring. To me, it looks a whole lot like a well. But they had a little um, mule-drawn trolley that would go all the way to the end of the pier and take you to the hotel and down to the train station. And this was a beautiful, grand hotel. It eventually became the Florida Military Academy and then burned down. Sadly, most of the places I'm going to talk about today eventually burned down because that's what happens to old Victorian buildings in Florida. If they don't rot, they burn down. The big wooden hotel in Green Cove Springs was the Clarendon House, and that's it in the background, and this is one of my favorite stereograph images by a famous photographer named George Parker. And I love these two lovely ladies sitting here in the foreground. That's the spring itself right there. So in that other picture, the white picket fence area would be right here to the, off the right. In some photos, you actually see a pump house here because the Clarendon controlled water and actually pumped it into the hotel. Um, but what I want to point out in this advertisement is they call it Green Cove Warm Sulphur Springs. Because uh, you have to keep in mind these people are here in winter in North Florida where it's a lot chillier down than it is down in New Smyrna. And the water is a constant temperature of 78 degrees. So if it, the air temperature is 30 degrees, it's 50 degrees warmer. So it's considered a warm spring. So this is called the whole idea of balneotherapy, taking the waters and mineral springs is really considered warm water bathing because the springs are constant temperature and if you're there in cold water it feels really warm. We tend to go today in summer and it feels freezing cold so it's it's a whole different way to think about it but you can just tell you know she's wearing some kind of garment that looks very warm you would never wear today. These were affluent people so they needed you know it's Imagine it's an all-inclusive resort and you have to have a lot of things to do with your time. 
there are many stories about people sitting on the decks of these steamboats just shooting anything that moved, in particular alligators. So there are accounts in the, at the end of the 19th century where people are worried about running out of alligators on the St. John's River because they have shoot and they don't do anything. You know, it's remarkable that they actually pulled these out of the water. A lot of times they would just shoot them and leave them floating there. Um, boating was a big pastime. Fishing, of course. So a lot of the people who were coming to the Florida who were not invalids were sportsmen, and that was heavily promoted. But this I love. This is a little shop, and the writing on it says, this is where we get our ice cream. So some things never change. The, I'll go back a few slides. The Clarendon ultimately burned down and was replaced by a hotel called the KC Sauna. And there was another KC Sauna I want to talk about later, which means here is health. And that was in the Mission Revival style or the Spanish Revival or Spanish Mediterranean Revival style. Um, it was torn down in the 1920s for the new city or the 1990s for a new city hall for Green Coast Springs. And this facility was built in 2017. So there's an open air pavilion. This is the third magnitude spring here. They put these um, big pieces of limestone out there. The water goes in a pipe into the swimming pool and into to a short spring and out into the St. John's River. And it's only open um, in summer months. Green Cove Springs is a lovely little old Florida town now, but they're building all these new toll roads from Jacksonville, and it's on the cusp of change. And so if you want to enjoy this, do it quick. <laughs> There's one bed and breakfast it was for sale, so I'm hoping it's still there, that was a cottage from the Clarendon Hotel that's run as a bed and breakfast. I think it's called the River Park Inn, and it would be this direction from this photograph. And what's remarkable is the uh, innkeeper there said people from Europe would come over to take the waters in Green Cove Springs. Has anybody been to Green Cove Springs on purpose? You have, yay! I love it. It's only like a half hour from St. Augustine. It's a, it's a great little place. White Sulphur Springs probably rivaled Green Cove Springs in that a whole town kind of developed around the whole industry of taking the waters. I love this as a photograph from the State Archives. I love these people. You can see their faces. I wonder, are they sick or are they just fashionable? You can see their bathing suits. Like, what is going on in that bathing suit? It looks very interesting. These people. But they came in huge, huge numbers. The spring house was built by a Confederate widow named Minnie Mosher Jackson. Her brother was a doctor, and she bought the place and hired an architectural firm out of Jacksonville who built this huge facility. This is the biggest spring facility in, in the state. Uh, it had a clinic, it had elevators, it had a gift shop. You probably left through the gift shop, I would imagine. <laughs> no, oh, oops. Note these, these ropes. I'm going to talk about those later. Those are safety lines for people who can't swim. Uh, again, you can see some are, are, are in bathing suits and some are just in regular clothes because a lot of people who are going to these places aren't really sick. They're doing it just because that's what everybody else is doing. That's just where society goes, to watering places. Here's the front of the bathhouse in 1969. I think it was torn down about three or four years later. Sadly, they, um, the Colonial Hotel was built in front of it, and, and you can see this modern, or not modern, but mid-century looking kidney-shaped swimming pool next to it. Um, here's what it looks like today. So there is, there's one level, all the other levels have been torn down. The spring no longer flows, sadly. Um, there was phosphate mining in the area and diverted the source of the water. So if there's large rain events, the water table gets high enough, it'll flow and you can smell the stinky sulfur smell again, but it goes away as soon as the water table drops. For the most part, most of the time it's dry. This is uh, where the water flowed out into the Swanee River. There were wood sluice gates that would keep the tannin state water from the river coming in, so it would be pure spring water. And it's part of Stephen Foster State Park. If you ever go to the Folk Festival, it's, you'll be right next to it. This is another one of my favorite places. This is in Safety Harbor. Has anybody been to Safety Harbor? Whoa, I love it. It's such a great town. And it's really a spa town. And it still functions in some ways as a spa town. This is the only image, and you know, I'm a graphic designer, so image searching is part of the fun for me. And I you know, gone, went to all these archives all over the state to source original images that had never been published before. This is the only one I can find with a pool in it for um, Espirito Santo Springs, which really, um, Espirito Santo goes back to DeSoto, who named Tampa Bay Espirito Santo Bay. 
there was five springs there originally. The story goes there was a guy who was stationed at, I think it was Fort Kelly during the Second Seminole War, who had a wounded Seminole prisoner who supposedly showed him the location of these springs for medicinal purposes. After the war, he bought the springs, and then his descendants owned it later. So originally it was called Bailey by the Sea after him, and then it was named Green Springs, and they changed the name from Green Springs, not to be confused with Green Cove Springs. And one of the things I noticed is that they changed names of these facilities again and again and again. There's several Green Springs across the state. There's one in Volusia County, actually. Has anybody been there? I should have put that in here. I forgot about that. It's a great spring. I love that place. I go as often as I can. And you can that's a great example because you can see it's not clear, crystal clear, blue water. It's It's got that murky stuff that indicates the high presence of minerals. That's what people were looking for. So a couple of things I want to point out from this shot that show the improvements of 1902. One, the springs are right on the water. That's Tampa Bay. And this is uh, the changing area here because when that was destroyed by hurricanes and burned down like all these wooden structures do, they replace it with this Mediterranean Revival building. But look how far it is from the water oh, yeah. because what they did is they added fill behind it and extended the property. So one time they had a golf course back there for all the people to go. This place is still open. Of course, they added mid-century additions that are over here. The, um, there's a park back here. I think the city or the county run the park now. But they do a great job of interpreting their history. So this is that little octagonal shaped room that I'll show you again. And they have a hotel room set up just the way it would have been in the 1920s. This has gone through ups and downs and ownership changes. At one point it was known because all these boxers would train there. Um, and that kept it going through all the years. There were people from certain families up north that would come here, and this was their place. Um, Ebbets family from uh, Ebbets Field in Brooklyn came here, and there was another one. Uh, mostly Jewish families from um, the New York area would, would come here again and again, year after year. So this is underneath that uh, octagonal shaped room, and this is where you would get your drinking water, kind of the water bar. And you can see the little sign here. Here it is today. It's actually um, near the uh, salon. But so they each spring, there was five of them, supposedly would cure different things. Mm -hmm. Number one was for skin ailments and stomach disorders. So I guess you soaked in it for skin ailments and drank it for stomach disorders. Mm -hmm. Number two, arthritis, yeah. dropsy, neuritis, neuritis, rheumatism, Bright's disease, kidney stones. Number three, liver and gallbladder, and a mild laxative. A lot of these have uh, springs have uh, magnesium in it, so they're touted as laxatives. Um, number four was beauty springs, so I guess if you had a bad case of ugly, that's what you <laughs> used. That. Now, I was wondering what happened to number five. So I was back along Tampa Bay at the end of the area with the fill, and I saw this pipe coming out, and you could smell the sulfur. And I think they, for some reason, they just piped that one back into Tampa Bay. And it's an interesting place, too. There are what's called submarine springs near the pier that bubble up right into the bay. And you can see them because a lot of times manatees will be attracted to that fresh water. Mm -hmm. Here's what it looks like today. I think it's a Greek guy who owns it, so he's put columns everywhere to make it look very Greek. But they, um, you can go into the, the beauty salon, and there's these plexiglass panels on the floor with PVC pipe, and that's where the spring is below. It's piped into the, these facilities. There's several swimming pools and hot tubs and all the water that uses the uh, spring water. It, it, it has to go through reverse osmosis and all this other stuff, so it doesn't smell like sulfur or anything. So, it, But it's, it's a wonderful place to stay. There's a lot of great history, and it, it's grown a lot, but it still has a lot of charm. I highly recommend as well as Northport. Has anybody been to Warm Mineral Springs? Yeah! I love this place. It's so unique. And it is a national landmark. And it's a national landmark because of the archaeology. Because it's, it's such an interesting spring. It's shaped like an hourglass. <clears throat> and thousands of years ago, Paleo Indians, it would, you know, as the Ice Age was ending, Florida was about twice as wide as it is now. And it was very dry and arid. So there were sinkholes with water in the bottom that attracted people. And so we know that for thousands of years, people have been going to what was the sinkhole with water in the bottom. And they have found intact mammoth and saber-toothed tiger bones, as well as human remains there. And they have found 
my understanding, a saber-toothed tiger skull with a spear point in it, so that we know people coexisted with them at the same point. This guy, his name was William Royal. He was an early advocate of scuba diving, an ex-military dude, and he, he kept diving down and bringing all this stuff up, and nobody would believe him that it was as old as he thought it was. So the story is he had NBC do a live um, remote there, and this was uh, Huntley and Brinkley, I think, was the show. So very early on. He pulled out a skull, and actually there was still gray matter in it that oozed out on live television. So everybody thought it was fake. Turns out he was telling the truth, but he was not a good archaeologist because a lot of these bones ended up in his fireplace, decorating his mantle. So there's a lot of controversy because... Um, you know, imagine the hourglass, so where it gets narrow, it's very sloped. And so at some point, somebody put tarps there and put 55-gallon drums to hold the tarps down. Nobody knows exactly what's under there and what's in the 55-gallon drums. And so it's very, a lot of different feelings. The spa history of it is this. So at the time, people were staying in that beautiful Carrington Hotel in the 1870s in Green Cup Springs. This is what what it looked like. And it was called Little Salt Springs at the time. We know that the cattle ranchers knew about it. If you wanted to go there, you probably had to camp. It was bought by a lady, um, her, uh, Mrs. George Brown from Philadelphia, and she wanted to turn it into a health spa. And so Ringling, who lived in nearby Sarasota, offered her a quarter million dollars, and she turned them down because she wanted to build a health spa. She never did. But we know that they, they allowed people to use the spring, and they would charge them a nickel. Um, they had some kind of cat that would walk on a higher wire there and everybody that the caretaker had, but it was never really developed until the mid-century. And they decided to jump on the bandwagon for the celebration of the state quadricentennial, which marked the, the 500th anniversary of the Tristan de Luna expedition to Pensacola. So they had all these big celebrations in Pensacola, and then they had the big celebrations in St. Augustine, and they thought, let's get some of this stuff after they're done with it, put it on display, and we'll get people going up from Naples to St. Uh, Pete on the Tamiami Trail. Well, so they threw this place together in five months, and it was a big flop. They spent millions of dollars, but the facilities are still there, and the architecture is amazing. And the whole reason they did it was in order to sell real estate lots near the spring. Because this kind of looks like a real estate lot, that's what it is. I mean, a real estate brochure, that's pretty much what it is. So here's the building. It was built by a, a famous um, architect of the Sarasota School of Architecture named Jack West. He designed this building to kind of resemble the hourglass shape, and the dimensions are the same dimensions of the spring. This, this was actually a cyclorama depicting the life of Ponce de Leon as you go through it. It's still there, but not open to the public. It's owned by the city of Northport, and they have big plans for this place to remodel it and build an amphitheater and have camping and glamping and all that sort of stuff. But this is probably the most loved place to take the waters in the state today. And the people who go there are Eastern Europeans and Russians. And they love this place. They, they believe there's no other um, concentration of minerals in any other spring in the world like this. So I don't know how it is today, but when I last time I was there, there was Russian bakeries and Russian restaurants and Russian churches and a whole Russian community there in order to take the waters every day. There was a, a conflict because at one point it was half owned by the city and the county and they couldn't agree on the vendor to run it, so they closed it and people actually pigoted because they were so upset that they couldn't take the waters there every day. And so they have water aerobics. They used to have a cafe, and they'd serve borscht and things like that from their clientele. It's a fascinating place. It's, it's a little bit different. Again, the water's not super clear. You'll find chunks of algae. But what's interesting to me is it's got a really small spring run, but I've seen photographs somehow, and it's far inland, somehow tarpon get in the spring all the way away from there, which Whoa. just blows me away. Uh, okay. Big change. We're shifting from balneotherapy to sea bathing or surf bathing. The, the roots of surf bathing are really tied to the whole notion of water being healthy. And I trace it back to a guy who wrote a book, Sir John Floyer, called Scarborough's Bra, or something like that. The city of Scarborough had a mineral spring. 
he went there to write about the mineral springs and he got this whole idea why can't seawater be good for you too when well, you can bathe in seawater and you have to keep in mind in the Mediterranean bathing was always part of a tradition because the water's warm but nobody wants to get in the cold water of England so the only way you're going to do it is if it's good for you so that was a novel idea and they would actually drink the seawater and I'm told it's better if you mix it with milk <laughs> a bourbon. <laughs> so the, and they, this was cold water bathing, where you know balneo therapy is warm water bathing. And it, one of the things they did was most people then could not swim. You know, uh, if you were the upper crust and wealthy, eventually you would have indoor plumbing. It was the unwashed masses who knew how to swim because they had to bathe in lakes and rivers and streams and stuff like that. So it wasn't until about 1850 where popularity or the uh, popularity of swimming starts to take off. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But what they had initially in England and, and in Atlantic City, they had these two, were bathing machines, which were these big wagons with giant wheels. Sometimes the horses would bring them in, sometimes men. This one looks like it's got some kind of turnstile. And they would have an attendant. You would, you would go in there closed and you put on your giant bathing suit that covered every inch of your body if you were a woman. If you are a man, you could swim naked. If you are a woman, you had to cover every inch of your, of your body. And they would have an attendant who would help you down all the stairs, hold you under the water, pull you back up, hold you under the water, pull you back up to you until you couldn't take it anymore. And it was supposed to be good for you, so people kept doing it. So eventually, this comes back to America, like, taking the waters and mineral springs does. And you can see these safety lines again because people don't know how to swim yet. You know, it's starting to happen. The, you know, the whole idea of being outside and exercising is a novel idea in the 19th century. It's starting to take hold because they think it's good for you if you are consumptive. But it's really not mainstream yet. So this is a novel idea to be outside. And, you know, you don't see people swimming. You know, a lot of times they're they're grasping the safety line for, for dear life. So here's in Florida. This, this, I think, is the heyday. And Flagler, he marketed the heck out of sea bathing or surf bathing. So a lot of the promotional material you see in brochures of that time, he talks about, and I'm going to show you one for Coronado Beach, um, how great the sea bathing is here. So when he built the points at Royal Point Sienna, is that the Royal Point? Yeah, and um, the Breakers. That's the heyday for bathing in, in around the turn of the century in Palm Beach. So there's all these great photographs in the Na National Archives of these, you know, upper crust Victorian people who came down Flagler's Railroads to go to his resorts, going to the beach, and the safety line going in, and, you know, and they um, are, are initially aren't there for exercise and recreational swimming, but that changes. And this is a great image, because here's the lady holding onto the safety line, but here's a swimming pool. So Fagner starts building swimming pools, and he starts getting swim instructors. And then so you see a transition from this is something you do, to it's good for you, to here's something to do. It's fun, recreational, and um, exercise is good for you. And that re you can really see that, and you see the mention of sea bathing and surf bathing diminish in the advertising that Fagner does. Here's one. From Coronado Beach, Sean Bathers. This uh, is from the State Archives, and I love this. I'm not. I found this somewhere online. I'm not sure where it is. It, it's not in your collection, is it? It is. Oh, sorry, I don't have a credit. <laughs> but surf bathing year round, and then this is a little thing from one of Flagler's. The surf is almost entirely free from underdog, making surf bathing particularly safe and enjoyable. Is that true? No. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. So this is a transition. I'm about to transition into hydrotherapy. I've never, I found this one online. I've never been able to find, find a version that's not cropped. But it talks about ocean bathing, and it talks about hydrotherapy. Because if cold water from the ocean is good for you, why can't cold water from a tap be good for you? And so hydrotherapy becomes something that's in vogue. It really has its roots in Germany and um, in balneotherapy as well. And it's a very popular thing for progressive individuals to do in the end of the 19th century. Susan B. Anthony, uh, Alcott, all those celebrities who are, were of a particular mindset went to places called water cures in order to practice hydrotherapy. 
And there was a whole mindset of healthy living. They would wear, instead of this tight, restrictive Victorian clothes, they would wear more loose-fitting clothes, they would eat a healthy diet, and they would exercise. So one of the few places, I found two places of that era that were luxury hotels that had hydrotherapy equipment. Does, any, does everyone or anyone know where the Alcazar Hotel was? It was it's St. Augustine. It's where the Leitner Museum is in the city hall. Um, and so they, so Flagner first built the Hotel Ponce de Leon, which is now Flagner College. Across the street, he built the Hotel Alcazar. And it originally was supposed to be kind of recreational facilities, but then the hotel, there was enough need for a whole other hotel. So he had all these things, all these different um, varieties of hydrotherapy. Um, and this, this is um, the new hydrotherapeutic apparatus. So they would hit you with these water jets with high pressure because it was believed that you know it would loosen things up inside of you and it was good for you and they had a lot of different things like that um, sits baths this is a, a needle shower same kind of um, thing this is the day so if you tour the Leitner Museum you can see this hydrotherapy stuff they call this the Senate it's either the Turkish or Russian bath I'm not sure one's dry heat one's wet heat um, but it's pretty much untouched the way it was and they have some of the they have a sits bath and that that newfangled hydrotherapeutic apparatus is still there too so the sanitarium movement kind of caught on it for consumptives and that's where it really started and if you know Advent Health it originally started as the Florida Sanitarium in Orlando a place where people would go and practice hydrotherapy and being outside and this whole um, notion of um, of different modalities of health care. Um, one of the popular things in the 19th century was heroic medicine, you know, things like, well, in the 17th century or 18th century, particularly like bleeding and leeches and, and um, tonics with all these bad things and a patent medicine. So th this whole idea of going into a sanitarium and living a healthy lifestyle was a novel idea. So the sanitary movement started in this country, in um, New York, and um, perhaps the most famous was the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan, started um, by Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. Right. Did you, anyone see the road to Wellville? Yes. <laughs> that's the scene from the movie, and that's the scene from real life. It was over the top, but you get an idea of what it was like. You know, that's where uh, cornflakes were invented. Originally, they had these um, biscuits that were said to break your teeth if you ate them. So cornflakes was a new invention. And John Harvey Kellogg is one of the most fascinating people. Um, you know, he had 40 adopted kids, believed in celibacy. He believed in all sorts of crazy French things. But he also believed in eating healthy food and eating things like yogurt. But he also believed in having enemas after every single meal. In some ways, he was ahead of his time. Some t ways, he was a whack. And he, he always wore these trademark white suits with a, um, I was told this is not a parrot. What is this, a macaw? A cockatoo. cockatoo. And that was his thing. And he wrote all these books on the practical uses of water for healthcare, several books. And so eventually, he has to come to Florida. And so he teased different towns, and he would go around and say, you know, I bring my spa here, and it was like he was entertaining bids. He ended up in Miami Springs, and um, this hotel was built by Glenn Curtis right before the Depression, and he wanted to unload it during the Depression. So the story is he sold it to John Harvey Kellogg for a buck, and John Harvey Kellogg said, no, it wasn't that cheap, it was five bucks. <laughs> so this what this was very popular. All the, the famous celebrities of the day went here in order to you know practice this new healthy style of living, to practice hydrotherapy up until the 1950s. Today it still exists. It's a um, well, it did. It, it's like kind of an old folks home. Um, the first wave of COVID, they had a high casualty rate, so I'm still not sure if it's open today. Another one I want to talk about is. This man's great uncle, Dr. Benedict Luce, is the correct pronunciation. He moved, immigrated from Germany to the United States, got ill, went back to Germany, and became a disciple of Sebastian Niep, who was one of the innovators in naturopathic cures, you know, water. Some of the things he liked to do would, would be, you know, he advocated for loose-fitting clothing, but he also thought it would, it's really helpful 
in the early morning when the grass is covered with dew to, to do to take your shoes off and walk on the wet grass and they believed in wrapping your body with wet sheets and hot sheets and cold sheets and Dr. Luce was healed from this and he um, Sebastian Eve said go back to the United States and spread the message and he became one of the fathers of the nat naturopathy um, I'm not sh he had some kind of doctor's degree but it got him in a lot of trouble so the conventional doctors were always having him arrested and there was a lot of rumors we were talking about some of the rumors but he like Dr. Kellogg decided to come to Florida and he settled on the small town of Tangerine which is near Mount Dora um, it's right there off of 441 and so he had a facility called Youngborn in Butler, New Jersey, which was an hour's train ride out of New York City. Youngborn um, here was called Casey Sana, which means here is health. And Youngborn supposedly means be, uh, be born again I, or something close to that. You would, he advertises its proximity because it was a little bit later to, um, was it the Dixie Highway? One of the major routes there that's now 441. Is it the Dixie Highway? And he also talks about you know getting off a steamboat in Sanford and taking a train to get there. Um, he bought an existing hotel called the Massachusetts and started his hydrotherapy or his um, sanitarium there. And it existed until the 1940s and it burned down. A couple people lost their lives and he was badly burned and ended up dying from his injuries a little bit later. And um, I'm fascinated to learn more with his descendant here and very excited too. And I have, this is his book, The Fountain of Youth, that he wrote in the 1920s, um, which is wonderful. Briefly, I want to talk about drinking water, because a lot of these, these you go to these spas, and you know, there was a whole regimen. You would start drinking the water, then you would bathe, you would have lunch, you'd drink more of the water, then you'd do some entertainment. Um, but drinking the water was always popular, and we got such a good reputation that it didn't have to be from a spring. So Orange City Mineral Water, which is another Volusia product, it was actually water from a well that was shipped all over the country because it had such a great reputation. And the um, World's Fair in St. Louis, after the turn of the century, it won the top award for the best tasting water. And the story that I've been told, again it's the story, is that John D. Rockefeller loved the water so much that he took it with him wherever he went, and he bathed in it and drank it. So who knows if that's true. But there were, you know, Zephyr Hills. We, it still <laughs> continues to the day. People believe in the brand of Florida water. So I want to talk a little bit by, about why this is important to me. This is um, Hampton Springs. Hampton Springs is near the small town of Perry, kind of in the Big Bend region of Florida. A guy from Chicago built this health spa there that, that was, um, initially there wasn't any railroads, but the, the railroad was extended a little spur from Perry so you get there by roads. And it mainly appealed to people from Chicago. And they would come there and it, you could hunt and fish on the Gulf. Um, well, you could fish on the Gulf and hunt nearby. And um, they always urged taking the bottled water with you. So you can see these people here. This is their little water bottling area. And they're filling their bottles up, putting it in cases. And here's a little swimming area. So. Of course, this place went away. Uh, I imagine it burned down because they all do. And um, it's owned by Taylor County. They cobbled together some grants and they did an archaeological survey and unearthed a lot of the remains of what was there. This is a photograph by my friend John Moran and David Moynihan where they did a series of, uh, they light up the spring and put them together in Photoshop. But this, I love this photo because it shows the mystery of the springs, you know, this is what I imagine, you know, in the minds of the Greeks and the Romans, the magic, you know, that existed in springs. So here's that area where you, in the other photograph, you could see them getting the water, that's that, and then here's the bathing area. So the county owns it, it's a county park, they put a fence down and it gets torn down and people swim in it, it's a local swimming hole. They're worried somebody's going to break their neck and sue them. So they do that. Aww. Um, so the residents of Taylor County were outraged and they really let their county commissioners hear about it. So they turned around and pulled it all out. And I don't know what's, how it's been resolved. Their idea was to put a mobile home there and have somebody live there and be a caretaker. But um, anytime they put a fence up, somebody tears it down because they want to get to the spring. 
there's a it's a wonderful site. And, and, you know, um, it's kind of off the beaten path, uh, but it has a, a power to it. And I think that's why this is important to me because this is an important part of Florida's tourism history that has been largely forgotten. And um, this is Sulphur Springs. It was just a little bit upsprings from White Sulphur Springs. But look at all the people here. And it was on the roof. On the roof. <laughs> and this spring still exists today. And it's a park. And I love this photograph here because, again, you can see kind of the connection. We are all made from water, and water is really important. And, and I think it's super important that we um, try and restore some of these places and maintain them so we have a better understanding of our state's history and our better understanding of our connection to water. And these are two recent articles in the New York Times. A guide to hot springs in the U.S. and cold water plunges. The two different modalities are now back in fashion. So who knows, maybe we can bring bathing back to Florida. <laughs> so that's all I got. I have books, both my books I will be happy to sell you. They have books here at the museum. I'll be glad to sign them if you want to buy them from there. And I'm happy to take any questions. Does anybody have any questions? Do you want to talk about your great uncle? Yeah, if anybody has any questions. You did mention that he wasn't a doctor in the beginning, though he had a lot of studying and self-talk. But the AMA got after him and everything. Now his wife, my great aunt, was a medical doctor. He went back to school and got his doctorate degree and said to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> he was very outspoken. I think he would, they, they had him arrested several times for, for, yeah. for practicing medicine without a license. And um, I think your great aunt opened the young born first, and then he came along. And, and I think it was her money. Right? Her money, and got connected. You also him. mentioned uh, Neep Springs, or uh, the German. Sebastian Neep. Right. Uh, my uncle studied under him, but. Uh, Sebastian also opened the springs in Kendallville, Indiana, uh, huh. somewhere around the turn of the century or so. Uh, Dr. Lust was my grandfather's brother. When my grandfather was ill, he came to Indiana, where my father's folks were from, and they met for the first time, and he spent a month there at the Springs, going through their it was run by the nuns in that now, but uh, going through their therapy in that. So who did you say owned the health food store? The what? Who owned the health food store of the brothers? That was Johan. Uh, that was in New York. So I've read that that's perhaps the very first health food store in the United that's States. That's what I understand. So, the, I mean, they, he's considered the father of naturopathy and such an interesting history. I won't share the story, but about the fire. There's rumors that are attached to that, and I decided I wouldn't put in print because I didn't want to perpetuate them. But I grew up with all kinds of, uh, from my mother and my grandmother, uh, kind of natural health stuff. And the one thing they always said is my Uncle Ben hated white bread. He said, that's the death of America. <laughs> he would take, they said, the cross off white bread, roll it up into a ball, and it's just a hard white ball. He says, this is what's in your stomach. <laughs> you can trace a lot of that back to John Harvey Kellogg. You know, the whole idea of eating um, whole grains really can go back to that. He changed a lot of people's minds. Did you see the, I think on this uh, History Channel, the foods that made America? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when they went through uh, uh, Kellogg's. Yes, exactly. It was very good. Didn't Dr. Phillips, he also had a lot of history to him. With I didn't see that one. Dr. Well, he wasn't a doctor. Oh. I mean, basically, he pasteurized orange juice. Oh, Dr. Phillips, I thought. From was. Orlando. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I mean, the, the billionaire by today's standards yeah. wasn't then, but, but uh, he, uh, he, he assumed the name and, and got in trouble by what, what I'm hearing, kind of the same thing, because he wasn't a doctor. He liked to call himself Dr. Yeah, and they had a tagline, something like, drink drink it because the doctor says it's good for you or something well, like that. Actually, <laughs> that's just the, the short and long of it, I guess it was World War One. he pasteurized orange juice, and then he sent it overseas to, or the, the U.S. bought it to send it overseas to the military, and that's where it, it got its start. 
And ironically, the Florida Citrus Board hired John Harvey Kellogg to write this big um, brochure I have a copy of. And he said, um, drinking orange juice will prolong your life by something like four score and seven years or some <laughs> crazy thing like that. It's like, I, I don't know what that means. Anyways, I'll let you take it. Thank you. Join me.